I want to thank the organizers for thinking of me to come and uh, <coughs> uh, pollute the, the young minds of future scientists. And uh, actually, I get a, a second attempt, a uh, second opportunity, I think, on Wednesday. So um, it's great to have so many young people in the audience. Um, so <coughs> I, I'm assistant professor at uh, Scripps and trying to uh, corral all the people interested in, in um, long-term tectonics into a, a fun little collaborative group, and I call it the Life Tectonic, in case you're wondering what that is. And for, I know we just had lunch, so I have a little, little gimmick to keep the grad students awake, which is the, the grad student that asks the best question gets one of these Life Tectonic pint glasses that are really cool, and because we're trying to get the students interested in asking questions. And uh, all right, so let's get, get on to the, uh, the Andes. I want to just <clears throat> talk about what things will not be covered. I don't have time to really go into a lot of the details of the fluid dynamics. I'm happy to. I'll be here for two weeks, and we can go into any level of detail that you want. Uh, rheology is pretty important. In, in what we do in geodynamics. And this is something that um, <clears throat> also could swap, just an hour could evaporate <clears throat> very quickly, as well as the uh, very technical aspects of the numerical methods and the models themselves. But I will show a little bit of this in the other um, little tutorial that I'm giving. And <clears throat> since I found out we're going to uh, preserve this for posterity with the the uh, recorder, um, I'm not going to review uh, past work for the chance that I could mischaracterize it. So I'm just limiting myself to stuff that I've been directly involved with so that um, if I mischaracterize anything, it's just um, just hurting me. I'll give you a little, little tour of what we're going to cover uh, real quickly. General aspects of geodynamic models, how we use observations. Um, my goal here is to try to give you, an, since there's not that many geodynamicists in the room, to give you a flavor of what geodynamics is trying to do. Because sometimes it, it does get confused as to what, what was the point of that. The model seems too simple. You know, these are things that we'll commonly hear in reviews. Um, it seems like you're just getting back what you put in the model. And um, so I'm going to take a little time to go over um, how we go about uh, using forward models to understand the data that everybody else is collecting. And a lot of the cartoons and cross-sections that people put in their papers, our goal as geodynamicists is, is to look at that data, add the physics to the cartoon, and come up with a way that can self-consistently describe what that data, um, how it is, to basically explain it. And, uh, sorry, and then um, I'm going to walk you through one, uh, you know, pedagogical type of example that's recent work related to the Andes, um, coincidentally. And what I want to try and do there is to, is to show you how we systematically study a system, set up the, the design based on what questions we're interested in uh, asking so we can test the hypotheses. And then just a real quick sort of uh, model verification. So for longer term tectonics, things we're looking at time scales, I'd say, larger than a million years is a round number. Okay, we're not looking at uh, earthquake cycles. We're looking at longer term things. So from one million years up to the age of the Earth. Um, the Earth materials are behaving like a fluid uh, on that time scale. So we use typically viscous flow models. And we could look at length scales from hundreds of kilometers, but usually thousands of kilometers. So we could look at. Uh, patches of real estate on the planet that are four or 5,000 kilometers each, each side. Or you know, we could look at, obviously, there's lots of whole planet modeling. But we can be restricted to more regional studies and, and put all of our computational resources into a smaller region, get better resolution. Some things that we, um, geodynamics, <coughs> will have two main branches. One is analog experiments which uh, like a sandbox that you saw earlier. And this is real materials undergoing real physics. This is numerical models is the other approach. And we have to ensure that the numerical models are representing 
reality and physics you know, with some fidelity. So there has to be a lot of careful benchmarking for us to believe numerical results. And even after that, you should be suspicious. But um, analog models are quite useful. And it's great when the two come together and they, they can achieve the same thing. And as um, the sandbox experiment you showed with the critical taper experiment, um, I couldn't tell if that was a, a, a numerical experiment or a sandbox experiment, because those have been benchmarked so well that they actually look quite similar now. Uh, design considerations. OK, this is really when you formulate a question that you want to answer. You've got some enigmatic observation. I'll, I'll list a few for the Andes. And how do we design an experiment to answer that question? OK. And then we'll, we'll, we'll you know, the, the, the process is you pose a question. You try to think about the boundary conditions, um, what kind of numerical method you would want to apply, or maybe the ones that you have available. Um, you know, normally, you want to write down governing equations and think about what, what you're going to solve. So you're going to think of the situation. Normally, it's convection, or it could be elastics or solid mechanics if you're looking at shorter time scales. And you know, governing equations are usually uh, conservation laws, mass, momentum, energy. We look at advection of temperature. It's usually quite important. These are coupled equations. They're, they're strongly coupled and strongly nonlinear. So it's very hard to do anything um, analytically with them. And then if you're interested in complex geometries, really your only chance for, for studying the system is with some numerical model. Geometry is, is critically important as well. Um, two dimensions can uh, lim limit the types of physics that can happen and impose a strong bias on what the, the model can do. And so it's nice to be able to use three dimensions, especially if you're looking at uh, time evolution. I want to talk about move that out of the way. I want to talk about what mountains are. We'll, we'll get over. That'll be one thing that we'll talk about. We're not modeling the evolution of mountain chains. We're, we're mostly looking at changes in the stress, the, the dynamic part of the, the, the vertical stress is a dynamic feature. And, if, and so for grad students, um, what's isostasy? This is essentially how we consider mountains in, in geodynamic models. We're looking on millions of years. Isosity is a, is a stress balance. It's a vertical stress balance. So the, the height of the mountain is rho gh. That's units of stress. What would be an output of a model is the vertical stress. So we just say those two are equivalent. And the amount of vertical stress represents the mountain. Okay. So we're looking at viscous flow models on millions of years. What are the mountains that we? have in the models, it's actually just the vertical stress that, that comes out. And the primitive variables would be things that we solve for, um, including you know, velocity, pressure, temperature, and, uh, and, then, and stress and strain rate are, are sort of derivatives of those. As I mentioned, um, normally we're in our comfort zone in using fluid mechanics for Questions or questions that involve things greater than a million years. We can look at shorter time scales. Uh, I'm glad Anno had a added critical wedge theory. I'm not going to cover that. There's also thin viscous sheets, which is sort of a semi-analytic approach. Um, there's been recent work on that. And then finite elements are sort of a general workhorse for lots of different um, lots of different software packages use finite elements or something similar to discretize the domain and solve the governing equations. Um, and so this, this is actually a, something that kind of straddles these two time scales, a viscoelastoplastic. So it has uh, components of elasticity. It has plasticity. And it's, it's being forced convergence. So this is a typical you know, numerical model setup. There's also laboratory experiments we explained. Um, typically, you have a fish tank. Fill it with honey or corn syrup. And then the, your, mo your model plate is a bit of silly putty flattened out with a little perturbation applied. 
And so these have been successful in trying to explore the dynamics of uh, plate tectonics. Okay, how much realism do you include in a model? Well, as I said, I think some people are, um, haven't really been introduced to the idea of what a forward model can do, but it is taking a situation back in time, running the model, model forward, and seeing if some output of that model is similar to some data that you're trying to explain. And you're not, it's not meant to be an exercise in trying to find the answer. It's an exercise in trying to systematically study the behavior to understand how the controlling, uh, what's controlling the, the physics of the problem, okay? And we're not generally aimed to recreate the Earth. We're trying to understand what are the major influences. You know, is it the slab dip? Is it, is it the, the, the melting that's important? You know, we don't know. So those are, the, those are the things that we would pose as questions. Ideally, we want models to be simplified to the point that they only include the, the essential physics that you are required to explain an observation. If it has extra things and you take them out and you still get the same result, that means that they weren't necessary. And they can just seem to complicate things. So it's not our you know, it's not our wish to present overly complicated things. It's our desire to f try to understand what is really controlling it at the, at the heart of the matter. And, and so that tends to be why things seem to be overly simplified, but they're simplified just enough. So we're going over that. Um, and then there's an issue of scaling, okay? Some of these, some of these models were obviously modeling large chunks of land in a, in a virtually in a, in a box or a, on a computer and, or as a fish tank, you know, that's meant to met, represent the ma mantle. These, we have to have uh, appropriate scalings. And this is a basis of, this is a, a fundamental tenet of fluid dynamics is that you have dynamic similarity and that what's true in one system can scale to the earth on a larger time scale. And all the fluid dynamics hinges upon being able to use dynamic similarity. This is why they can model a jet aircraft, you know, the seven, the triple seven, modeled completely on a computer and then built and it flew just, you know, as they had developed it. So this is a basic tenet of being able to uh, use scaling, dynamic similarity. And then there's just, part, this is part of life as a geodynamicist. Um, and I'm sure Greg Hirth will comment more on this. Their rheology is the hardest thing. The, the equations themselves, the governing equations, flow laws, there's a little bit of non, there's nonlinearity and everything, but the main beast in all of that is the rheology. We can't, and so it's our answer for how to represent the rheology of plates on time scales of millions of years, on length scales of 100 kilometers, are extrapolations from experiments that are done in the lab um, at smaller strain rate, uh, sorry, at, at much larger strain rates and uh, on shorter times and smaller samples. So there's a large extrapolation between, say, where we have information from laboratory experiments and what we have to use in our models. And this is just a subjective aspect of being able to model things. So, yes, this is our goal, model the essential physics that determine the behavior system. So that's, that's the genera generalities of geodynamics. And I hope that, that helps put things in perspective, what, what we do, um, at least what I do with, with forward models. I just thought I'd throw a little anatomy of a subduction zone up. There's a subducting plate going into a mantle, a little bit of corner flow, okay? You've seen this in intro geology. There's, a, there's an arc between the arc and the trench. Sometimes there's an accretionary prism and this is that four arc basin can be eroded. This is um, the four arc area. Behind the trench is the back arc area. Sometimes you can have rifting or spreading or extension. And uh, also back here, there's a, the, we know the plate is, has a, uh, an outer rise topography. So and that's reflecting a, uh, a bending moment of this plate. And the reason I like this picture is because it shows 
um, this, that there is a radius of curvature for the, the slab as it bends into the mantle. And it's, it's not a sharp angle. Okay, there, All slabs have a radius of curvature as they enter. And the dip angle that you would define as some tangent to this line at any point. So that what is the dip angle? It's sort of more appropriate to talk about um, a radius of curvature. And I think this is a public domain image I found on Google search, but I didn't give credit because I couldn't find it again. OK, so I have a simple model of a, this is a two-dimensional model of a plate. And this is a subducting plate in a mantle that's a, a thousand kilometers deep. Uh, started off with one of those little perturbations, like I showed you with the, the fish tank um, silly putty slab. And it starts to sink. And what's control the only things that's specified in this are the strength of the plate, which is sort of the structure of the lithosphere. It's cold, so it's, it's stronger than what the, the mantle would be. And the buoyancy of the plate, OK? So there's no temperature. Um, in all the models that I'll show you, we're not considering the advection of temperature because the, the time scale of this model, there's a little bit of diffusion over the, the 30, 40 million years that this plate subducts, but it's, it's we'd argue, not um, significantly going to influence the dynamics. It's a uniform plate. And what else is going to say? We've, we've simplif here's one simplification. There's no mantle convection here. Mantle convection is, is implicit in this, in the sense that the buoyancy of the thermal boundary layer, of a cold thermal boundary layer, is just specified by a density contrast. So we've simplified mantle convection down to a, a uniform density contrast that makes this negatively buoyant and want to sink. And that's, one, that's our first simplification okay, of mantle convection. So if you'll allow me to continue under those simplified. Yeah, Michael. Dave, you haven't shown us the equations, but you said strength of the, of the plate. Is Thanks. everything here a Newtonian fluid and you're letting viscosity vary? Mostly, yeah. Uh, everything's a Newtonian fluid. There's a viscoplastic layer on the top here. And uh, so that allows for some failure. And I'm, I'm sort of glossing over these details because I have a lot, a lot more of that in the other uh, tutorial that I'm going to talk on Wednesday. So the gov this is essentially Stokes flow, um, conservation of mass and momentum, and uh, in an infinite Prandtl number kind of limit. And, and we have just described different layers of uh, viscosity in the, in the plate in a Newtonian sense. And the top layer is allowed to um, have a finite strength so that it can break and fall into the surface. Right. Ah. <laughs> so for the mantle, it's a fluid on geological time. And the slab is sinking. And it's, it's, we could consider it a fluid on geological time. And in this limit that we're considering, the only, um, the only force balance is that the weight of the slab is balanced by viscous stresses. Okay. So it's, it's viscously dominated flow. And the driving force is the density difference. And there's no inertia. That's the key thing. That's the analogous way of thinking about it, is that there is no inertia in, in the system. So it's not like a normal um, other kind of fluid that you would, you would be used to. Things move very slowly. And, and it's creeping flow is the uh, other thing for kind of Stokes flow. Uh, OK, so I want to get back to now this, this is the same model with an upper plate. And what you don't see is, is a little bit of corner flow here that, that keeps that up overriding plate connected and, and viscously coupled. So this is a coupled system. And now I told you, we only specify two things, really. The, the, the strength of the plate is just controlled through the viscosity of the plate and the buoyancy of the plate. Everything else is free. 
we've also controlled the fact that it's, it's stuck in two dimensions. So that, that imposes some, uh, that has a major impact on the, on the flow. But for uh, it, illustrative purposes, everything else is free. So the trench can move. The plate, this is the tail end of the plate. It can move through time. These things are not being prescribed, OK? So they can move however the system would want them to. So we can have trench retreat. Um, if, the, if the trench retreats backwards, we can have forward plate motion, some combination of the two. And when we add in an overriding plate, it's kind of a passenger in this model. It's just following the plate. The subducting plate is the driver, and the overriding plate is the passenger, at least when they're sitting in a, in a big box. And, and that's another simplification. Uh, this is the horizontal velocity. So the overriding plate has a positive x direction for this one. And there's a sharp uh, change. That's the, that's the uh, <coughs> plate coupling. And then this is the sub subducting plate motion moving this way. So there's a convergence there. And that would be represent the convergence in that system. So it's a simple model of a convergence zone. OK, so boundary conditions. All right, I just told you that in this middle case, the upper plate is a passenger. And it'll happily follow the, the slab that's driving. If the slab wants to drive the plate forward. The upper plate goes with it. But in this case, let's imagine that you have a huge overriding plate, Asia. OK, it's not going to just be a passenger. It's going to completely dominate the, uh, what the subducting plate wants to do. And in that case, the subducting plate has no choice but to only move, only move forward. And it will only subduct through forward plate advance. Um, if, this has a, a very, if it's very strong and it won't extend, then this will be a stationary uh, subduction zone. If there's a little bit of, of weakness here, then you could get some amount of a uh, little bit of trench retreat there. But for the most part, this, this large continental plate would dominate what otherwise would, would be a free system. Conversely, if in the Mediterranean you have these large, um, you have plates that are subducting uh, Africa and, and Eurasia, so this is sort of a, a plate where the, the subducting plate is fixed, is say Africa, and it's not really, it's a, a, approximately stationary. In that case, it can't move forward. It's sort of pinned to the back wall. And the only plate motion that can occur under those circumstances are trench retreat. So in the Mediterranean, we have several places of trench retreat. Yeah. No, plate advance. No, the, the subducting plate can move forward. Tren so trench advance is, is different because trench advance implies that the trench would be advancing into the, into the overriding plate. So uh, the default thing would be to have stationary trench with a plate moving forward and subduction occurring through forward plate motion. You're, you're, you're implying some absolute reference frame. Mantle reference frame, okay. correct. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the sides are also, thanks for bringing that up. I meant to add that. The sides here um, will also influence the flow. So in this case, they think they're uh, reflecting. And that means that the flow can't go through. These are actually walls. okay? And the real Earth, the mantle doesn't have walls. It's all interconnected through a, a spherical shell. And everywhere is influenced um, instantaneously. So it's. Uh, so why don't you use periodic boundary We could. I mean, then you, you, can, you can use either one. Neither one is perfect in two dimensions, right? Because in periodic boundary conditions, if the flow comes out here, it's, it's going, to, going to come back in here and, and influence the slab as well. Um, that, that's another way of doing things. But in, in two dimensions, neither, neither is perfect, neither is the Earth, you know? So, yeah, those are, those are things that you have to be careful about. Is the answer that you get being determined by the boundary conditions on the system? Okay. So, it's an important thing to keep in mind from the very beginning. I want to talk about the plate coupling in these viscous models. So, the overriding plate, I said it's viscously coupled to the subducting plate. And 
we measure that through the horizontal stress. So this is sigma xx, the horizontal stress. And what I want you to see is that for those three types of models with different boundary conditions, what's happening here at the interface between the two plates is the same, no matter what the situation is. It's always got about the same level of coupling. So the far field boundary conditions can determine the overall dynamics of the system, but the upper plate and the subducting plate, their coupling in a way that's this, their, their coupling is not influenced by that. And that's important because that means we can say something about what's happening here and, and we don't have to be as worried about the boundary conditions influencing that because we have a strong coupling in all the situations. Okay. Okay. Um, some of these will be building upon the observations that we've already seen this morning, so we can reinforce some of those. There's a timing to the Andean uplift. Uh, oh, actually, and there's been subduction off, off of South America since Mesozoic, and you know, even so older than Cretaceous. But the Andes have only started to really be uplifted, as you saw, that speed, speedometry uh, uh, since about 45 million years ago. Okay, so why, why, were the and why was it just a normal arc subduction zone for over 100 million years and then suddenly start to pop up? So this is, this is kind of a major question. There's diachronous, diachronous growth across the origin, both north, south, and across. There's a western cordillera you saw, an eastern cordillera, a central plateau. They all started to rise at different times and to different extents. So there's not a uniform kind of uplift. It's, it's patchy, and you saw a really great movie of how, how patchy the uplift is and how heterogeneous it is. What's controlling that? This broad central plateau is the, is the thing people are really wondering about, and I'll, and I'll just say that consider both parts of it. Well, why is there a plateau? This is a strange feature. You know, um, it's, new, it's very few exist on the planet. Why is it in the central part? And, and it happens to be thickest and broadest at the place where the shortening is the greatest, right? To me, that is also strange. <clears throat> there, the curvature of the margin, you saw that the, the, there's been these subduction zones and the, uh, the plate margins, they're dynamic features. They're as dynamic as the plate motions themselves, the plate boundaries are moving just as fast, sometimes faster. And most of the time, a subducting plate has a normal kind of curvature. If you look at the Aleutians, right, we have this nice representative arc. Everybody knows the nice arc. That's a standard, you know, Japan, all these, all these places, that's a standard curvature for a subduction margin. And the Andes, right around the Bolivian orcline, is exactly the opposite. Why did that curvature develop? And then the Eastern Cordillera, where there's ongoing orogenesis, why do you get mountains so far in from the subduction zone when all the, all the main stresses are right at the plate margin, right where the plates are strongly coupled? Um, this is another mystery. So there's plenty of mysteries to be solved here if you're interested in working in the Andes. There's no shortage of uh, things to worry about, keep you up at night. This is a, um, an older picture of the uh, Nazca slab. You can see a lot of, it's not a uniform looking slab at all. It has a lot of a long trench variation. And uh, you already have been introduced to the, the long trench variation in the, the size of the plateau. It's topography that thins to the north, thins to the south, both in height and in lateral extent. And you've already, already seen this cross section, which is an impressive four kilometers up flat plateau. That's an impressive feature that's really hard to imagine how, how it's gotten there. And then we have this nice summary slide that you've been introduced to showing the different 
different parts of there's the plateau and the foreland the, where the eastern cordillera are more rugged and this sharp sharp uh, steep gradient right at the western margin I think that should be 2006 so sorry about that there we go fixed it um, and then the timing of this so this these areas this is what I mean by diachronous this is going uh, age okay so time going that way and here we're looking looking across the width of it when did the major shortening occur okay uh, we saw things started to to move and there was some you know some shortening started occurring 45 but then a big burst um, well here at 30 but a lot of stuff here at 15 okay there is a major major acceleration and then down here in the south a lot a, a different story altogether so spatially temporally various heterogeneous shortening yeah Really old arcs, basement that's Mesozoic, that's an arc product. So they're rugged arc rocks. The arcs since uh, the um, early to mid Jurassic, what's the oldest? Well, there's some early Jurassic, it's kind of a funny arc. The, the main volcanism begins at mid Jurassic, but uh, there's also Paleozoic volcanism subduction as okay. well. Uh, I, I mean, it's been a subduction margin since the Ordovician. Yeah. Except My, for a short time during the time of Pangea. So when you're talking about Andes being something that's happened in the last 50 million years, that's superimposed on something that's it's not a passive margin or something. It's actually some pre-existing arc deformed. It was a normal, itself. typical arc, happily existing for at least 100 million years. I mean, it's, yeah. What what happened in well, we 45 and 50 is the subduction right. zone started to go shallow, and that's that's the secret. It could be. It could be. It could be related to slab slab dip. There's a lot of things that that influence slab dip. So but yes, I mean we we don't have them exposed at the surface because the level of erosion in the central Andes is not big enough. But we have the Patagonian batholith exposed in the south, where uh, erosion is more efficient. And uh, the core of the batholith uh, is uh, Jurassic in age. Yeah, and the, the Mesozoic bathal is well exposed in Peru. Yeah. In Peru, right. Yeah. Even right at the trench, when you drill exactly. in, you, you hit Jurassic exactly. plutons right at the trench. Exactly, yeah. Sure. Good. Convinced there's a mystery there? But it's one of the big, big open questions. Why did it only start in the early tertiary? And why nothing in the rest of the Mesozoic? Uh, different stable isotopes, um, paleo botany, all kinds of uh, different data are available to indicate and corroborate that it is a recent event that this uh, uplift has been, been happening. Some work by Garzioni and Hartley, earlier work. Uh, the shortening is interesting. So this, this is a. Um, <clears throat> A summary of where there would be shortening. Here's the axis here. So red means lots of shortening. Uh, yellow means not so much. And from this time interval, from 15 to 45, where, where you've seen this already. I'll put it back down uh, right side up, I guess. And this is the cumulative shortening, all centered near the thickest part. So lots of shortening there, and also some crustal thickening. Um, that's, well, I'll show you that on the next slide. But in this area here, um, it was pointed out already, the central plateau is, is, is stable, not moving, and not deforming, with very little shortening, and all the actions happening out here on the eastern margin. 
So, and then it tapers significantly to the north and south, a lot less shortening. So concentration of shortening at the center. Okay, this is an older, uh, more than 10, 10 year, almost 10 years before the other uh, <clears throat> fancier version that was shown. But it, they had the answer already back then, 70 kilometer thick crust back in the, in the central part, maybe even 80 here. So this, we've known that the, the, the thickest crust here is in the central part. And so we, we think that, and then it thins to the, to the north and south again. So a lot of variation, north-south variation. All right, so a plate motions have been changing what, over this time. And what do those look like? This is, sorry, you may not see this, 10 million years, 20, 30, down over to 60. And this is a, uh, a, a, a plate reconstruction which is showing the age of the Nazca plate over time. And there is variation as far as how old the plate is that's being subducted down the margin. And right now we have sort of a, uh, recently, the oldest plate has been subducting in the center part. But previously, some of the uh, oldest parts were, were, were not at the center, but were off to the south. And we can, another way of looking at this is, is, is just drawing the, um, this is latitude here for the South American trench, and this is the age going back in time, 60 million years, and this is the, the age of the plate that's being consumed. And, and I want you to see that there's been a, a period recently, since about 20, uh, 25 million years, where this pattern has been persistent. And before that, the pattern was shifted a little bit to the south, what was being the, the maximum age or the thickest part of the trench. And I'm showing you these plate age variations because the age corresponds to the thickness of lithosphere. And we think that the thickness of lithosphere going down has something to do with what's going on in the collision zone. OK, this is that same uh, history here. And looking at. The, uh, you can see there is a lot of north-south variation at different times, where are the maximum age that's being subducted. But the Nazca plate is the sort of integrated sum. It's a coherent plate, okay? So you'd have to integrate all of this to get a convergence. And the convergence has been changing uh, over, this, over the last 20 million years. So this is the, if you integrate what the age, the average age of the oceanic plate. It corresponds that the, the fastest convergence was when you had the largest amount of old plate. So the Nazca plate is, is driving the system and the age of the subducting plate determines its thickness, its negative buoyancy, and therefore some of the convergence rate. There is some agreement on the convergence history over time. Uh, these are a couple different models of Strolius, di different latitudes from the Strolius and Mueller 2006, some older work uh, here. But there's, there's a fair agreement what the history, this is uh, most recent, this would be GPS here. Uh, in the last 20 million years, we had a, a spike in convergence. But there's fair, fair agreement what the convergence history has been. And this temporal signal, OK, is this what's, is this have an influence on, on the system as a whole? Now I'm showing just one of those, the, the most recent one, the Strolius and Mueller. And I'm showing only the Nazca absolute velocity in comparison to the total velocity. And I want you to see that the Nazca is actually tracking and, and most of the convergence is taken up by the subduction of the Nazca plate. Okay, a little bit is taken up by motion of South America. But for the most part, this entire uh, history of convergence can be explained through motion of the Nazca plate. The age of the trench, if we, aver if we average over the entire thing, or if we look at a particular uh, southern latitude, 
the average age is, is showing this trend, and at least for this past 40 million years, the average age was increasing dramatically, and it was a maximum from 20 to 15 at the exact same time that the speed was going. So this, again, builds on our idea that the Nazca slab is, is subducting, controlling the convergence rate, and that the lithosphere age and thickness and buoyancy of that downgoing plate is controlling the convergence rate. So that tells us we should just be maybe thinking about the Nazca plate. This is the topographic profile again, uh, north to south, in, in showing the maximum elevation and that it drops off sharply from the central plateau. And this is South America on its side, showing here's the oldest uh, seafloor uh, just off the coast of the central portion of the, uh, this dashed line is, is this uh, profile here. Okay. And it seems like there is a correspondence between where the central plateau is, where the oldest, thickest part of the subducting plate is, and also where the thickest crust is. All these, all these things correspond to the center, and also the, the maximum shortening. All right, um, take a break for any questions. If there were. So these are meant to be the large-scale tectonic and you know, plate motions, the big observations that a geodynamic model would attempt to explain. The topography, the, the height of the mountains, we can look at the vertical stresses. The, the extent of the uh, orogeny, we can look at the extent of where there are large vertical stresses. And uh, now I'll show you a model that I've been <coughs> uh, working on with uh, collaborator Fabio Capitanio. And he's, uh, he's given me permission to show some of this stuff. It's not published, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's right or wrong, even after it gets published. But I think it's a, it's a nice model. We, we, do some, we look at things systematically, and uh, we try to test a hypothesis. So here's our question. What, what, now that we've, we've looked at all these things that um, vary north and south, well, which ones are really controlling the system, and which ones will be, are, are because of other things in that system? Okay, the convergence rate, we want to simplify that as the Nazca buoyancy um, is determining that. So it's just the average age of the Nazca plate. Uh, long trans variations, we want to look at that age gradient in time, but we know we're just going to look at a, a, a representative age gradient where it's, it's thicker in the center. And the crustal thickness in the upper plate, we don't know what the original thickness of the plate was. It, we, we could imagine that it was at one point a uniform thickness and that it's been thickened in the center preferentially over time. We don't know if that, should we, should we choose to include uh, a crust thickness in our model from the beginning or see if that you know, will be an emergent feature? So these are types of questions that you would ask. Yeah. Are you going to manage the last 15 years when there are more surface or? Our model is going to look at about the last uh, 50 million years. So, yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I'll show you both. I'll show you one where we just assume a constant um, uh, north south variation, and then one at the end will we'll add time varying variation to the Nazca plate and, and, and see the difference. So I'll we'll answer that exact question for you. Um, where were we? Okay, trench curvature and motion. It's a, it's a free system. to It's allowed to evolve uh, in a way that the physics would determine given the strength and, and buoyancy that have been prescribed. So we let that become a free, uh, that, that is an emergent feature and we want to check if we get the right answer against you know, an oppositely curved uh, margin, opposite to the normal. Topography, we can look at vertical stresses in the model and see if the, uh, the highest mountains will be in the center part. And if they taper to the, to the north and south, this would be something we want to match. Uh, though again, also with the horizontal extent, 
can we get large vertical stresses inland at the, and, and try to have a model that has an eastern cordillera? And, uh, and can the model produce a, a plateau? So we think that obviously these, these things are emergent features. And, and any model that you would propose should have to uh, be held to having these things emerge from it. It's a, it's not a free surface model. Yeah, so it's just, it's vertical stresses. You missed that part, yeah. Yep. So, as I said, here's a cross, so it's a three-dimensional model. Here's a cross section of the subducting plate, and when it starts off, it's like 40 million years ago, here's the um, South American plate, uh, the trench going along, along this way. And we're going to vary the thickness, lateral thickness, uh, in representing the age gradient in the Nazca plate, where the oldest part is in the center, so it should be thicker. And in the South American plate, after that initial period of shortening, if we assume that that built up thicker crust in the middle, then we could, we could say, well, perhaps the upper plate has a slightly thicker portion in the center. So we're going we're gonna to also include that. And I'll show you with and without both of these and in combination. OK, some other simplifications that you know, seem reasonable to the geodynamics model, um, or me, anyway, to add to a model. Um, I've, I've mentioned we're not, we're not considering temperature. We're prescribing mantle convection as a density um, difference. And that's, that's just described, pr prescribed in the plate. The viscosity, we know the lower mantle is more viscous. On the time scale of, the mantle of this model, actually this plate doesn't really get down to the bottom of the, the tank. So we can neglect the bottom two thirds of the mantle because we think it's a very small, um, having, adding those in, we get the same result. So we take, take them out and run more models without them, okay? Um, and that this part here is, there is a viscosity increase. We model it as a, as a, um, a step function increase. This is viscosity, so it's a gamma is the ratio between a, uh, a, a reference viscosity, which would be the upper mantle, and, and whatever material you're looking at. So if it's the lower mantle, it's about um, a 50 or 100 times more viscous in the background, so it would be come in about two orders of magnitude. And the plate is initially about two to three orders of magnitude more viscous than the, the background mantle, so that's dark blue. What else are we missing? Sidewalls, we, there's a gap here between the plates and the sidewall. And that's so that we're not actually just running a 2D model in a 3D box. There has to be some, some accommodation for flow around the slab edge in order for the, the full three-dimensional flow to develop. And uh, we have a horizontal extent 4,000 by 8,000. Is curvature important on this scale? Maybe. Um, but we, I, could, I could show you um, some things that would indicate that it's not. And it's, it's counterintuitive. We, we actually think that it should be. And every time that we look and see a, a model with, with that's actually spherical, a regional spherical model, uh, there's, there's certain things that, that are exactly the same as a, as, a, as a flat earth model, even on this scale. So it's, it's not intuitive why a sphericity is a second order effect, but um, we, can, we can talk about more. So questions here? This is the initial condition here. This little perturbation is about 100 kilometers deep. And that, that little perturbation is able to start pulling the trailing plate down and initiate subduction. And the main uh, the thing, actually, this is a great, thanks for uh, bringing that up. This is a key, key aspect of this model. In an absolute mantle reference frame, the plate motion here is determined entirely by this slab 
pulling the plate. There's, there's no large scale mantle convection or pressure gradients or anything pushing this plate. It is simply this slab pulling the trailing plate through a stress guide because it's a high, there's a, a high viscosity layer in the middle and that stress guide is able to produce the plate motions that, were, that result in a convergence. Okay. Um, this is distinct from a lot of other approaches that have been uh, adopted and the talk on Wednesday try to convince you more that this, this type of system can reasonably model plate motions. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a slab pull driven model. The whole slab is, uh, you know, roughly not not deforming. There's when this when this is pulling, this this plate, the trailing plate is strong enough to sort of just stay coherent, so it looks just like a nice continuous feature. Yes, there's 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 small yeah there's stresses, but we don't have, for example, <clears throat> this. It's not extending to the point that the, the perturbation is going to, going to neck and, and fall away. David, I think the question might be getting at the seismic consequences. So what would you see in the In the slab, the state of the stress of the slab? That's what Earth gets <laughs> Yeah. No, that's, that's the, uh, I don't think that these models can really address what the, um, what the state of stress is inside a slab, at least, at least these ones, because the state of, this, of stress is going to be completely dependent on the, the lithospheric uh, strength. Okay, and uh, there's, there's a lot of nonlinearity, there's a lot of different ways to, to achieve a similar strength of how you concentrate strength um, within the, the plate. Ah, so you're, th Isn't that right? so you're wondering if, if this whole trailing plate is in extension or not because there's no, there's no push on the back? Yeah. No, the, the, the plate's strong enough that this, this pulling it down, it just maintains a nice, uh, nice uh, low, low horizontal stress throughout. So it's not an extension. Yeah. The velocity of the plate might be higher than the push. Yes, yeah, but... <clears throat> You wanted to have it balanced because uh, if you were pushing faster than the slab was pulling, you, you'd probably buckle the plate or something like that. So you know, wouldn't want that situation either. But yeah. So there's no ridge ridge push in this model, All right? Well, yeah. This is a, this is a uh, an end member model, con a, a conceptual end member where we can. Try to produce all the plate motions simply by uh, slab pull. Yeah. And is it really okay to do this in Cartesian geometry because a curved shell has much greater buckling resistance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, <laughs> I, I, as I said, it's it's not intuitive why why. But I'll show I'll show you a few comparisons between large regional models and spherical models that have just that actually ha haven't been published yet either, and they're not by and they're not done by me, and they have remarkable agreement in their plate motions and also um, in the in the curvature that we observe in the in the uh, plate boundary. So the trench motions are the same, the plate motions are the same. I don't know why it is, but it it is. So yes, there are stresses, there are extra bending stresses in a spherical geometry. There absolutely are. These are finite element, yeah. And the order of your elements are sufficient to resolve bending moments? To resolve bending moments. We, we do get bending moments. We get, you know, we do get a, uh, a topographic outer rise. We can measure that and plot that against. I'll show that in the, in the other talk as well. Any plastic behavior is it all this? So the top layer has a, has a, has a, has a, a yielding layer. The very top layer has some 
we'll call plasticity, so it has a finite strength. It can, can break if the stress gets too high, just like real rocks. So of course, it's not guaranteed that the ocean will just sure doesn't extend or it will exceed those stresses. It will maintain coherence. Well, we want it to exceed these stresses. Where there's regions of high stress, we want, we want it to exceed those stress to keep, to keep the system kind of lubricated. All right. So a uniform plate, we don't have any thick parts um, on either the upper plate or subducting plate. And we're going to look at this velocity. This is the vertical stress. So this sigma yy, we would convert that to, that's a proxy for topography. So we would say in this model, there would be a very high topography right at the margin, right above the margin on the upper plate. Um, dynamic pressure, and this is the stress invariant, and this gives an indication of the overall stress. It takes all of the stress tensor and turns it into a scalar, gives us an idea of the overall stress in the, and you see that in this case, there's high, high vertical stress on both the subducting plate and upper plate. In this case, actually, a much larger uh, bulk amount of stress, you know, is only in the upper plate. And if we vary, then, the total thickness of the overriding plate, we have 40, 60, and 80. And we look at the stress distribution. Um, OK, we're looking at patterns of stress, really, to see how, how does the pattern of stress change. And so this is also the second invariant of stress, yeah, sigma 2. Let me, let me show you the result of integrating um, the surface a stress. We see that there is a, a broadening of the stress when you go from a thin plate to a thick plate. So if the, if the, th the overriding plate is thicker, that, that same stress that's available gets distributed over a broader extent. And what we're, what we're thinking is that some plates some parts of the plate, the north and south, are thinner, and so you get a concentration of stress more at the margin. But if the center part of the plate is thicker, then you would get uh, a more broader distribution over, of overall stress. So maybe a broader mountain building area that's not specifically at the margin. Why is there stress in the lower plate? Uh, uh, or more stress? Like, uh, OK, these stresses are from bending, because this, this, this is, is uh, heavy and pulling the plate. And it's, this, is, this is bending the plate. So that stress is from bending. Whereas this stress in the overriding plate is, stress, is mostly due to horizontal stress from the viscous coupling that also results in some amount of vertical stress. So this stress in the upper plate is a product of the convergence, and the stress in the uh, subducting plate is, is both product of the convergence, but probably dominated by the stresses of bending the plate. That's a good, good question. So I already said, maybe this, where the, pl the plate's thinner, is the north and south. Maybe this is where um, kind of the center. And then in the very center, you have very thick upper plate, um, just basing on its crustal thickness that you would get a broader a smearing. OK, and now we want to systematically explore what happens with the age gradients in the Nazca plate. All right, so here's our simple system, two rectangular plates. And we're going to put a thicker part in the middle of the Nazca plate because um, that's the oldest part. All right, and we start off in the beginning with a perfectly straight trench. And what happens is that we get the opposite, we get the normal kind of curvature for an oceanic arc. It's opposite to the sense of South America, the Bolivian orocline. And we can look at the, um, what's interesting here is looking at, at this uh, a deviatoric stress again, we see some amount of no nice north-south gradient and maximum 
in the center. And we also get some inboard at the uh, back of the plate. So this is indication maybe that's related to the Eastern Cordillera. So we kind of get the overriding plate stresses look right, but the trench curvature is completely wrong. But an interesting thing is that the, uh, when we look at the vertical stress on the overriding plate, we have a low topography to the north and south. And then where that uh, thicker Nazca plate was subducting, we get very high topography. So we got that part right just by including an age of simplified gradient of the lithospheric uh, plate thickness. OK, you know that one. Yeah, I'll show you that. All right, now let's, let's keep the overriding, the uh, subducting plate uniform. So pretend all that's the same age. And let's consider this part thicker because there's been shortening and crustal thickness, okay, uh, crustal thickening. So we'll just add in, it's a uniform plate, but this is thin, this is thick, this is thin. Okay, now it looks pretty uniform. Um, along the margin. Maximum stresses are the same at the bottom as in the center. We didn't get anything here in the in, in board of the plate, but we got the right shape. We got that opposite sense curve, curvature. So mixed results again. And also, you saw that there was a very little gradient north-south, and you see the amount of stress across the trench is fairly uniform. So. This would be an Andes that would be you know, the same. And we know that that's not the case. They look like that. OK. Um, if we combine both things, which, which is the, uh, do we get the best of both worlds? We get a vertical stress that is still a concentrated in, at the center. So, and we also get a slight. Um, uh, the, the curvature is at least in the right direction. So we think that the, uh, over the convergence history, for a, a single convergence rate, the variations in the, in the Nazca age structure in the last 20 million years, or 25 million years, have had a thicker portion in the middle. In, that has led to some initial amount of shortening, OK? And then that shortening created a thicker part of the overriding plate. And these two things then collided to form a nice central peak and start to develop of that plateau. And this is a summary of the <clears throat> um, three different models. Let's see. Yeah, I'll skip over that. So I'm running. Okay, let's look at the, uh, at this case with the upper plate. We had a, a high vertical stress, so high mountain ranges right at the western margin, steep. So imagine this is, this is our proxy for mountain building, rho gh. Imagine that's a steep western margin. Very low stresses here. But if, if orogeny, um, critical wedge, everything is fluxing material in, we can have plateau building. What we want in here, in the middle where the plateau is not deforming, is actually low stress, right? But then there's this bump of high stress out here inboard. This is actually 800 kilometers. But there is a, a mechanism to, to get some a high stress inboard of the upper plate, quite far inboard. And maybe this is a, a reason for the Eastern Cordillera developing. Just to look at the, that stress invariant, the pattern of stress is really what we're looking at. The pattern of stress, we have a sharp central high a western margin, high mountains there, and then tapering to the, the north and south. And it's these two stress bands here, due to the collision of the two thicker parts of the plate, that create a, a high stress inboard, where they, where they meet up. And it's possible that those are helping to propagate stress 
inboard of the, uh, of the subducting plate. Okay. Yeah. Your model that just had the variation in thickness of the incoming plate, and you had the wrong curvature of the trench. Is it evolving with time? Because you kind of, in a way, or you made the thing that caused the trench to go inward. Is that in they, the model? They right? evolve with time. You had a thick crust that you made only in that middle part. Mm -hmm. And that was the ingredient that you needed to get the, the trench to move inward, to go inward. So, if you look at your, your first model that had only the variation in incoming plate, mm -hmm. is it moving towards the, the answer that you, when you started with the variation in upper plate thickness and thickness? Okay, so I see what you're saying. This one here, if, if, if it's variation in the lithospheric, in the oceanic plate thickness, that begins the shortening and crustal thickening on this side, then it means maybe the Andes or maybe South America system started off like this around a 45 million years ago. And, and this is an interesting question because people worry about um, here, it's actually, it's actually has a, a term called oroclinal bending and that the oroclines actually have, you can measure paleo, um, well, <clears throat> there's some people in paleomagnetism look at oroclinal bending and, and there's other ways to do it. I'm not that familiar with it, but I know that actually I think there's some evidence that there's been a lot more bending than just what the... So it could have been that this was the, the initial phase and then after some shortening this, uh, this, th crust, this center part became thicker and then we, we evolved into this sort of mixed system that, that then triggered the uplift and the main central plateau building and the stress pattern could evolve in a way to get a low stress in the, in the central plateau, high stress on the eastern front, high stress, sharp gradient on the western, on the western cordillera. Yeah. <laughs> Are you talking about the convergence rate? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we're assuming a constant convergence rate, essentially, because we've prescribed a, a constant buoyancy in the, in the Nazca plate, but it has a... But maybe between the 45 million year and 20 million year that the rate was going up, you have this configuration, like bending in the other side. And then when the shortening is harder, you create this bending. It's coincidence. Uh, there are some coincidences between the bending and the 20 meter years. I don't know. I don't know. We've only started exploring the system. And I think that you know, we wanted to start with just some, just look at these effects with a constant convergence rate. and you know, see how far we get. And the model's still gonna be not explaining everything, but we do know it's just the average thickness or age of the Nazca plate that's controlling the overall convergence rate. So, you know, we can add in a time varying buoyancy to the system and see if we get, you know, a better model. But, you know, these things we have to build on top of uh, starting from, a, you know, the most simple model. If that doesn't work, make, add, add another complexity. So, oh, oh no, what's next? And then, and then you're next. I like that uh, there's kind of positive feedback setting in as the curvature or oroclinic bending occurs. I'm asking because uh, you may remember this one view graph that I showed this morning indicating that the margin may not have been linear at the start, that there may have been an initial bend. Yeah. What would that be doing under the conditions that you are discovering? It could be. I don't know if it goes the right way or not, but I, I want to I wanna look at what that... I have not seen... You know, what you showed today was new to me, and I started trying to think about how that, how, what the implications are if there's excess of bending that we can, we can see, you know, what the original, try to infer what the original curvature of the margin was. Yeah. Okay, and you had a question. I was just going to ask, it's not hard to increase the company along that. So, have you tried to do that with the construction of the Nazca plate? Because the Nazca plate is 
explain this is the lack of sediments in the trench in that area, which would reduce, well, would, would increase the coupling. Just Are you talking about seismic coupling? You know, in terms of you know, stresses. Okay. Friction. So our our models. Thanks for bringing that up. Our models are aiming towards a lubricated type of boundary with very low stress in the shear direction. Okay, which would be like the the frictional or seismogenic type of coupling. But the suction across the plate boundary is strong, despite this part being very weak, and that the plate can can slide down very easily because of low shear stress, the horizontal compression, that's, that's the horizontal plate coupling, that those stresses transfer across the plate margin very well. And that's why you can get stress transfer from the subducting plate into the overriding plate. So there's two types of coupling. One is this seismic viscous, uh, you know, for friction coupling, you know, that we think of with faults. And the other is a horizontal stress transfer and that the, the two plates are coupled through, the, flow, through, through the, the underlying flow of the mantle and the suction at the plate margin. So, well, this is kind of a question for Omar, actually, but if you know the answer. So, <clears throat> one of the things you said was all of the, was the plateaus in turmoil like drank, so all the sediments were being poured into it. So, if you drew the basement for a clock under the plateau, what would that look like? Interestingly, the, the top of the basement uh, is uh, more or less at the same elevation uh, that it was at uh, before a plateau formation started. So the surface is not uplifting because the crust is uplifting, it's uplifting because you're pouring sediment into it. So, so this kind of stress model actually would more or less predict what, what it would look like if without the sediment. We need to have a very low stress, stable interior for the entire time that the plateau is building. Otherwise, it wouldn't. Uh, we would see it. I think it's almost in an inert kind of plateau. It needs to be just lifting up, from what I can understand. Well, while you're here, one question I had is: Could you say a few words about uh, the physics of why thicker crust uh, on the Subduction plate or the uh, South American plate controls the curvature of the subduction zone? I mean, what's causing that? I'm not sure it's the result, but I just wonder what physics is behind it. Controlling the curvature. If the curvature, when I mean, you show the horizontal line going one way or another, yeah. why does the thickness of the plate uh, affect the curvature? I mean, what, what's causing that? I think that, you know, The stronger plate doesn't want to bend. With the, the relative strength between the two, there's a bend. I mean, we think about this is the map view, and there's bending. So you could think of a, a bending moment being applied to this plate, bending the plate this way. And that bending moment that's being applied is a product of the three dimensional flow and also the, the coupling, the plate coupling across the plate boundary and the, and the horizontal stress being transferred across that boundary. So both of those things are combining to give an effective bending moment to this plate. And uh, I think what you just see is that the weaker plate bends in the stronger plate uh, maps. A, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. We, have, we haven't really explored and try to uh, quantify what how these pl why these plates bend the way they do so could it be that the plate's denser right so it's going to sink faster and so the central part of the subducting slab is going to roll back there i mean didn't, didn't you show that in some of your the, yeah that the I, velocity I, factors in the, in the mantle that's so part of it that's part of it moving back faster so are the, you seeing that the integrated strength is less the other plate because it's thicker Integrated strength. I think the, uh, if the thicker it is, then the, st the stronger the upper plate would be. Yeah, 
Yeah, but in our models, it actually means it's it's uh, it's stronger, thicker would be stronger in these models. There's mo yes, and there there's multiple things going on here. What the plate boundary? I mean, I have this is sort of the Andes part of this program came first. So some of this is it would have been better presented after. Um, some other things showing how plate boundaries and subduction zones move and what, what, what first order things control. But this has got at least two con major con competing influences. That's what's going on, and, and I showed that for three different situations where the plate boundary is moving different directions, the plate motions are completely different. It always looks the same if you just consider that, um, and that, that has to do with the nature of the horizontal coupling. Can you just walk through the, the, the shape of that curve? That's yeah, can I, can I come, come back to that after I sure. finish this up? So, yeah, I was, I was almost to the, the you know, <laughs> grand uh, finale with, with the, uh, the, the final cartoon. <clears throat> these, um, so we think these stress bands here help, help transfer stress to the back where they, and where they meet uh, helps produce this uh, <clears throat> high stress. And we think about this, this is, a, this is where the convergence is. As, as Ana was said, it's, it's the, the Brazilian craton that's moving in that's creating the orogeny, right? So you need to have a convergence out inboard of, of the subduction zone to, to drive that orogeny. And the, the margin curvature with some re amount of retreat to these trenches helps generate uh, and produce these stress bands, which uh, would probably be accommodated by some amount of, of, um, of shear or, or strike slip faulting. So we put, we put some sort of strike slip faulting. And then this just by conservation of, of mass, because the mass has to go somewhere, this mass is being pushed in. So this is kind of a map view uh, of, you know, he, earlier you saw a, cr a critical taper theory, which would have just been through, through a system like this. And, and this is showing that there's actually, you know, you can get a three-dimensional variation in that critical uh, taper theory and, uh, and explain some of the, why the active shortening and the, and the most uh, greatest short, the, the greatest rate, 50% of shortening, is happening out in the eastern margin. That's where the orogeny is being built, and that's where this major convergence is between the stable plateau and the uh, Brazilian craton. So this is a model. I was glad to see it wasn't on the usual suspects yet uh, hit list. So, um, yeah, good. Or maybe it's a really good question, and you could win a pint glass. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you remind me again what is the physical meaning of the second stress band? Because it's invariant, and if there is any physical explanation why the colors of those pictures are anti-correlated, for example, the green is the actually the maximum here, but I'm not sure if that is the same. Here. Okay. Right. So, so um, the color scales are different in both, exactly. and. Uh, the stress invariant, the stress tensor has nine components, and so the invariant tries to come up with an, a representative scalar value of the overall stress. And so it's giving you a magnitude of stress. And we are using that magnitude of stress as a proxy for where there's high stress, there's going to be mountains. And then we're looking at, in conjunction with that, the vertical stress to sort of give us an indication where the highest vertical stresses are in the system, because that's probably where the mountains are going to go. So the stress invariant gives us an idea of what the magnitude of stress is, okay? And, and we see the pattern of where the, the large stresses are, and the vertical stress is informing us, you know, where there could be sharp, um, you know, gradients in, in, in stress in mountain building. 
So we kind of need both of them to build a picture of where the mountains might be in these viscous models. Okay. Now this uh, has, so yeah, red is the highest stress there, and red is, is highest shortening here. And so this would mean, um, this, would, this is higher stress than the interior, and that's what we have here is that this is green, so this is higher stress than, and we actually get quite low stresses in, in there, which would help keep those nice, flat, unperturbed areas of the plateau from being uh, jumbled around. Ah, okay. So you're saying these are super high stresses, but these aren't very good. Um, not a lot of shortening right there. Yeah, only thing I can tell you there is that where stresses happen in our model plates, geology really screws things up. When, when it comes to <laughs> figuring out and translating to the actual Earth, and where the shortening has happened is, is sadly not attainable by our simple models. Um, I think it's just the surface pattern. We're not we're not integrating through the whole um, lithosphere, but I I'm not 100. Yeah, from. Uh, no, this would be just like <clears throat> this is the stress distribution in in a plate that's subjected to these to the forces at that, at that point in, the, in model time. So it's, not, it's, it's meant to be representative of uh, most of the, the time period of the model, but it's a single snapshot. And we're looking at the, at the stress pattern. So it's not, it, I, would, I wouldn't want to say the seismogenic, you could, you could make a connection to earthquakes with, with this, but more just where the topography would be, where there's. Where, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, this, this is got the, it's dynamic, We've, it's deviatoric stress. The stresses get really big, right? Correct. pressure. So this is like taking the stress tensor, subtracting the pressure from it. We subtract out the hydrostatic portion, and this is deviatoric stress. If you look at if you look at an independent um, at a stress component, then it will it could be positive or negative. And if you look at the the this is a scalar, which is um, the the invariant is always positive. So you can tell where where this tension. Is. Correct. Yeah, you'd have to actually go and look at the individual stress the individual components of the stress tensor to get that. So if you, you need this inventor, this thing to come in to start your curvature, if you take that away, does it go back? Um, if you like, made it a finite bulge so that the, weak, the, the regular that this year followed did with the curvature recover? We, have, we haven't we haven't checked we haven't checked yeah I mean these are these are kind of our first generation these are really meant to be exploratory models you know we we weren't expecting any um, <coughs> to explain any of the enigmatic features or you know this was just kind of let's just dip our toe in the water and see see what we get with considering some north south variations in in the plates but yeah I mean obviously there's a lot of a lot of places we could go with this and uh, there was. Your question er early, okay. Well. Yeah, I actually have the opposite question, a little bit of framework on our suit. So if you, had, if you need at some point, potentially, a thicker crust to create that band, and nowadays you find relatively uh, the free cambrian, like Equipa Massif or whatever, you find that close to 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 the trek line, not by, at the trench, but already far, far west. This is maybe subduction erosion that eventually kind of you know, takes away thinner crust and eventually exposes this potentially you know, old crate on to, uh, to that system and then, you know, finally you have the thicker crust there. 
So basically, the subduction erosion transporting it, some thicker crust that is further east at some point earlier. Is that potentially possible? And timing wise, would that work? Well, the problem is there's a lot of terrain collisions in the Paleozoic, so you can't look at it that simply. You're forgetting the, the Paleozoic and Mesozoic history of the Andes. You're not starting with a uniform system. Yeah. That's, that's going to really mess things up. And that, that has a lot to do with what's along the coast. Yeah, so one of our simplifying assumptions is that, um, you know, at the start of the model, things are homogenous, and obviously they weren't. There is some pre existing heterogeneity in the system, but we're hoping that uh, the things that happened most recently are not being, are, are actually more important in influencing the system, you know. But uh, we can't rule it out that there's some pre existing structures that, that are actually more important. So. Uh, okay, yeah. Ah. So you showed in the beginning, you showed the paleogeography or you know, the reconstruction of what this plate looked like. It seems like your simple models there show the effect of if you have you know, a more dense slash subducting that you know, this kind of, you get this kind of curvature as a result of that. And that I understand that's the point to test these simple ideas. So it seems like you've proven that that, that indeed happens. So it might make sense to go back then to that and then actually start with the geometry inspired by the, the more recent uh, arrangement of the plate. Because it looked like when you showed that, it had actually two areas of, of more dense plate. And where you currently have this curvature was actually at the less dense variety. And so it might have set this kind of uh, curvature now. And what you're seeing now is actually the fact that those who have been consumed, you had induced this curvature, and now you've got uh, more uh, negatively buoyant here, part there, but it's kind of gotten stuck um, as a result of what happened recently. And that might be something, I mean, I, I think you kind of alluded that's something you're going to be interested in pursuing. I think, I think you went a pint glass, because you just set me up for my last two slides perfectly. <laughs> perfectly. All right. We, we, we're interested in that period where earlier the plate, the Nazca plate, had the thickest part down in the south, the more southern location, just to check that we're not ruining the model by assuming it's always been in the center, exactly as what you just said. And we're trying a couple of different variants of what the uh, past Nazca uh, plate age used to be. One here, one with sort of a thicker extent here, and one here. And you see there is a little change See this, this offset in the curvature? They're all the same direction. The patterns are slightly different, but this, this one here actually shifts that bend up a little bit. So we don't destroy the pattern, but we modify it by considering the earlier age of the Nazca plate from before uh, 25 million years ago. And that, that, that older um, part of Nazca being further south uh, earlier in, in the model's history, so this is meant to kind of reflect that. Yeah, we get, we get uh, a time-varying buoyancy, modifies things. But why we did this is to make sure that in all, all three models we get a nice central peak and the, and the highest elevation is still in the, in the center here. And that it still steepens to the north, and the, or sorry, um, shallows in topography and, and width to the north and the south. So good. Good question. All right. Well, I'm done. Is there more questions? Good <laughs> <laughs> more questions. The blood of off there is. <laughs> if not, there is. Coffee. There's one here. Yeah. <coughs> No, we haven't really gotten that, that far, but that's like, we want to look at the time. We also want to look at spatial temporal history of the whole uplift system, you know, that's, but um, what do we need to include as a minimum to start to, to look at that and, you know, because otherwise you're just creating some artificial history that, you know, may or may not be connected to reality. 
So probably not. <laughs> Michael. Dave, were there other examples of subduction zones where we see the same kind of geometry, but not this kind of optometry deformation pattern? The same sort of opposite sense curvature? Ah, uh, so uh, there is an age variation in in, Ala in Alaska as well. Cascadia. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we. Are, I think that's a good point to start testing this and looking at the lithospheric structure. Um, a, across that's in front of all of the you know <clears throat> convergence zones because if it yeah why would it only apply here it would it would express itself at all the margins so the, yeah maybe there's something more about about this system or may, maybe we're just wrong but we have a whole room full of future scientists that can that can prove it wrong <laughs> Well, it's about the same latitude to just to the north, the Caribbean. Um, the Caribbean is a large igneous complex, and it, about 50 million years ago, it's going to go a little bit earlier, it's going to enter between the Americas. And it came from down here, so it's conceivable that there was also an LRT that impacted this um, coast. What do you think would be put in play with a lot of buoyancy? What do you think would happen? Yeah, it would change things because the uh, you're changing the buoyancy structure of the of the plate, and uh, also probably changing its thickness. So, you know, I think that plateaus. I haven't really test checked this, but I my suspicion is that plateaus strongly influence the flat slab, help promote flat or flatter slabs and, and shallower dip angles or um, larger radius of curvature because they're changing the buoyancy structure and they're I mean they're they're compensating some of the thermally negatively buoyant so they're making a plate overall less negatively buoyant then they're also thickening the plate in a way that would be make it stronger and able to support more of the um, subducted slab so I th yeah I think that that will influence things Lots of reasons for why we have this bin. You know, different amounts of coupling, for instance, or I don't know, suggesting the evolution of weakness uh, in the present. I feel like it'd be interesting to start comparing the different ideas and, and see if you can resolve which one might be more important or what the relative magnitude of stresses or how you might differentiate them in some way. But just to comment on how to respond to that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, yeah. I mean, it's. Uh... <laughs> Well, Arnold gave the suggestion that you know the, the faults are you know, you're developing a zone of weakness that's allowing the continent to shorten. For instance, that, there's a model that uh, makes some sense. Right, that wasn't that, that didn't have the curvature of the trench evolving. Right, that was just why. It, well, as it shortens, it would, you would get that. I mean, so he's got shown in his cross sections is with more shortening where it's weaker, you develop, develop the sort of bend. And to accelerate shortening. Also. So there must be some kind of positive feedback. Yeah, kind of bend to the east. Well, you get this bend because that portion of the trench is moving eastward in South America as the Altic Plano moves eastward right? because you have the deformation to the east of the Altic Plano. Right, I, I got that. I guess I didn't understand that, that, that it also affected the more kind of the trench. Oh, yeah, I showed the reconstruction. There wasn't, that was, there's good reason to believe that there was an initial bend that wasn't as expressed as the present day bend, so, but it was not a straight linear margin. So this kind of um, inherited uh, geometry, what does it do with further evolution? Uh, will, the, will the kind of positive feedback develop by this mechanism? 
or by, by focusing mass flux into this bend, which the GPS data tend to suggest. Um, whatever the you know, situation is, it looks really like there is a self-accelerating or feed, uh, system with feedback that focuses information there more efficiently than elsewhere. There's also a model by Scheller, probably aware that uh, it's a geodynamics model as well. In, in this model, the upper plate is driving westward and pushing the subducted part of the Nazca slab back. And, uh, and then, so there's differential trench migration. And at the ends, the trenches migrate faster because of toroidal flow around the edges, and that causes the, uh, that causes the uh, backwards arc. So, I'm familiar with it. There's yeah. Brian Isaac's 1988 paper too. <laughs> <laughs> you should huh? I, okay, I'm an author on the paper. I'm guilty. <laughs> I uh, I ran those models, so I know that's that's. Yeah, I mean, and when we were a couple of years ago, we were thinking about that as a as an explanation, but I I don't think that it. I mean, this model is more appealing because it stands up to more scrutiny if you start to look at the distribution of the mountain building. If you really start to think about the where. Are you going to have an erogeny? Um, and that, that other model isn't going to be able to stand up very fast or very long to, the, to that, you know, when you start to look at the vertical stresses. So that's, that's what kind of motivated this study. The only trouble I have with, with your model is that it's, it's the, the reverse arc is controlled by the thickening of the upper plate, right? Or the, yeah, right, the th because when you hit, when you subducted the thicker part of the subduction plate, that caused the, the normal shape, right? Yeah, I think that so the, the, so the thickening of the upper plate. The thicker, when, when we only had a thicker Nazca plate, the system wanted to have more trench retreat and rollback in the central part. Right. And that pushed that central part towards the west and developed that sort of opposite, the normal curvature, because at that, I think that the, the way the partitioning would work, trench retreat would be more favored in that with a, with a thicker Nazca plate. But then when we add in the thicker overriding plate that's stronger, it overwhelms and, and dominates that, the overriding plate's back in control and not allowing the trench, the subducting margin, or the subducting plate to have that slab roll back. So it takes back control of the system. But the, I think, and I will talk about this tomorrow, <laughs> is I think the geophysical evidence is that the central part of the Andes lithosphere is thinner on average and weaker, not thicker and stronger. Yeah, that's the next thing to, to look at is really try to map how the, how, I mean, what we're doing is really looking at the, at the strength. So. But it's a nonlinear system, and you know we could have the answer right for the wrong reason, or we could just have it wrong. But yeah, I, I want to think more about you know. There's lots of with with lithospheric strength. There's a lots of different ways to um, to determine that because it's always the weakest chain of the link that fails that actually sets the overall strength. You know, the strength is dominated by the weakest member. So. Uh, and there's a lot of different mechanisms to generate weakness in, in lithosphere. But the thing to, that these models are trying to, um, to address is like this mesoscale strength of the plate that is representative of how, the, how strong the plate is on millions of years. And I don't know really how to extrapolate from whatever types of information are available to that sort of mesoscale lithospheric strength. I see Greg nodding his head, so you're, you're okay with that. I, okay, got it. <laughs> just a remark. Uh, in the case of the India and the collision, we also have the plateau, but then the curvature is the opposite of the big one. So, although it's a case of collision, but uh, I think I remember from the reconstruction from the past that uh, in the case of the India Asia, you always had. The yeah, I, I don't want to talk about India Asia. That's it's two continents crashing into each other, 
And we have, we have nothing to say about that with these models, so. Yeah, with because there is also a plateau, I don't know if maybe you would compare this with uh, Osanandis. Yeah, I'm not prepared to say. These, these models have nothing to do with India, Asia. There is a plateau, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs>